Welcome to the Marketing AI Show. I'm joined today by Jeff Coyle, the co-founder and chief strategy officer, which is a new title we'll have to get into in a moment, of Market Muse. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, chief strategy officer. You were, up until I looked on LinkedIn this morning, the chief product officer. When yeah. did that change happen? On uh, this recent Thursday. Oh, um, is that right? <laughs> made the change. So you are, I think you got it the day after. I'm really focused on um, kind of innovation and new business initiatives uh, with the new role. Um, and kind of previously, I was managing the product data science, engineering, and marketing side okay. of the business. Um, but with the promotion of Chuck Frydenborg to CEO, uh, and my co-founder, Aki Blog, is focused on uh, financing and also partnerships, and I'm taking a bit of a horizon scanning, uh, new business initiatives focus. Um, and it's, it's extremely exciting. We have some major announcements coming in 2021 that I'll get into a few of today, uh, <laughs> but not all of, uh, and those will be my main areas of focus. So very exciting, very that's, exciting. Change. That's awesome. Well, congrats. I, I know I have been seeing the, the changes happening from an org structure standpoint. So I won't get into asking you a bunch of questions about that today, but we'll definitely have to talk about that afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, why don't you tell us what Market Muse does? Like, tell us a little bit about the company, the the solutions you guys offer. Yeah, sure. So we are, and as I, as I wouldn't be here if we weren't, we're an AI <laughs> uh, enabled content intelligence uh, solutions business, and we focus on content intelligence in that we want to figure out what it means to be about things using natural language processing, using our artificial intelligence platform. Um, and we apply that to page level analysis, to site level analysis, to inform content planning. So what content should I create? What content should I update to have the biggest impact on my business? Um, and the un one unique differentiator for Market Muse is we take it all the way down to implementation. So it's not just us giving you an idea. We'll walk you through a single source of truth of a content brief. We'll start, as we're gonna talk about today, building content drafts for you and take it as far as you want to go. And so what we're really focused on is making sure that people have, you know, data-driven insights that guide their content, um, but also they're able to justify the investment they make in content. Um, and I think that those are the two main areas of opportunity for, you know, for content marketing, especially with regard to artificial intelligence. So. And what's your origin story in terms of AI? I mean, what, you know, career path, how did you end up co-founding a company powered by AI? Um, the short version of it, uh, my <laughs> background's in computer science uh, and um, the two main areas that I researched when I was in school, I'm, I'm, uh, this is quite a long time ago, back when, you know, search engine meant internal enterprise search engine, uh, but it was kind of, enterprise search as well as usability theory. Um, so I've always worked in the search engine space, uh, okay. whether it be building ad servers and, and search engine products for lead gen or uh, in search engine optimization and content strategy. Um, and after um, going through an acquisition of my the business in which I really originally worked from 2000, 2007, um, I worked for quite a bit of time with a team that had a very large content organization, wonderful, ex excellent editorial team um, and group of writers. Um, and throughout that experience, really learned every possible workflow for trying to use data to inform those content decisions. Um, and late in that uh, uh, run at that company, at that publisher, I had all these documented painful processes um, and I started to research people who were really innovating in natural language processing. And I came across my now co-founder of five years who had built um, the original technology for Market Muse. Um, and it was really focused on evaluating a concept and saying, if I were an expert, how would I cover this specific topic? And so the original technology was, you know, that was the Market Muse, the core. Um, and I brought to the table a lot of these workflows and we had scientists and um, you know, developers who could automate them with emerging technology and artificial intelligence. So it was through having the experience in you know, content strategy planning um, and, and search engine optimization and an understanding of how those search engines work, 
that I was able to inform uh, the teams to automate these really painful processes. Yeah. Um, and that's really been the journey uh, for five years. It's, you know, I had the background in the technology, um, but these emerging concepts, these emerging spaces just are, you know, they're multiplying by, you know, 10, 20 times the innovation every year. Um, and so you're just playing, you're trying to stay, you know, current constantly with anything related to natural language. So, yeah. And you guys have been on my radar since the early days. So I, you know, I think I've shared with you before my path for down AI started in 2011 when IBM Watson won on Jeopardy. Right. And I didn't know what AI was. I did not have a computer science background like you. I was a journalist. Um, that was my training was in journalism school. And so not too long after that, a few years later, I actually attended South by Southwest. And there was a, a panel with um, the Associated Press and Automated Insights. And they told the story of how the Associated Press was using what they were calling natural language generation, which it is in a form, to uh, create hundreds of uh, earnings reports every quarter um, and turned into thousands using this tool. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I literally sat in that session, like, can AI create content? Like, can it write blog posts? And I think that was 2015, it would have been March of 2015, probably right around when you guys were creating Market Muse. And that was my like, I had already been studying AI for a few years, but that became the driver to me. It's like, well, that's what we do. We figure out what to create for clients to help them grow their business. And then we create it. Can, is AI going to take that from us? So why don't you walk me back to like 2015, were you guys thinking about that same fundamental use case of like, can AI create content? That's really an awesome question. Uh, the, um, the vision for generation probably didn't happen. The vision that generation could be a reality and the type of content that we were looking to influence and types of updates that we were looking to influence uh, probably didn't happen until a year after that. Okay. But the original, in that 2015 timeframe, um, the, the inspiration was turning data-driven insights into a format that a journalist or an editor, editor, or a writer, or a subject matter expert would accept, and they would be excited about receiving. Um, and that is when the content brief was formed. So okay. the original content briefs we built were manual. We actually took data from multiple Market Muse proprietary data sources, and we, you know, compiled a you know yeah. content brief, and we delivered it to customers by hand. Uh, now all of that is automated and scale. Um, but that was the first entree into building something that inspires a writer to, you know, be able to put their best foot forward and take their expertise and amplify it and not bog them down in things like keyword research and not bog them down in things like, you know, hitting publish and hoping something does well, which right. is very common still to this day and not an understanding of, of content efficiencies. Um, but not until the, I would say for me personally, um, it was hearing at the uh, Intelligent Content Conference, uh, nice. hearing about, I think it was 2016, it could have been uh, late 16 or early 17, it was hearing about Heliograph in person, uh, which is the Washington- I was Post. there. Yeah. I actually, I moderated that panel. That was crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I thought yeah. I had read about it and yeah. I read about it and- uh, what was for me inspiring was when they talked about covering the Olympics mm -hmm. um, and they had said prior to Heliograph, we were only able to cover a small percentage of the events, but after Heliograph, we cover all of them. And the one thing I remember was uh, uh, the, there's some errata or, or, or error in the way that Olympic events are set up. And he explicitly calls out the templates and how they have to like put exceptions and rule-based exceptions in the mm -hmm. templates. And one of them was, uh, did you know judo had two bronze medals because of the way the event's set up, if I remember th that specifically. And I remember going onto my laptop immediately after going, leaving that session and researching judo rules and <laughs> awards in Market Muse. And it immediately told me that the two bronze medals would be a special differentiating factor. And I was like, oh, wait a second. 
Might be on to we something. can do something here too. Oh, that's fascinating. And so we could we would build the brief, and the brief would naturally have surfaced that that was a point of differentiation, and why it's something it's a point of differentiation in the topic model. Yeah. But that got me thinking that wow, if we can produce those same, they didn't have that value. They had to manually set that rule. Right. We don't. We had already automated that. Hmm. And so it told me that there was space there. So we started working. Um, and I can get into some of the details of the progression, but we started researching um, summarization. Okay. We started researching abstractive summarization. We started researching um, other types of kind of technology that was in its infancy. Um, and we actually took two or three swings at that before thinking, wow, things are too expensive. Um, the technology is just not there. And that, and we spent, we, we took some cycles against that. Um, our head of data science and, and now a chief technology officer and then our, our current head of data science. Um, and we have a number of scientists and uh, still working on these challenges said, you know, these things, we got to put them on the shelf for a few months um, and see what happens. Um, and then, uh, you know, about a year later um, through two of our scientific advisors and the research that that same team was doing, we found that the ideas that we had proposed for the this specific platform, which I know we'll talk about, yeah. were, po were possible. And not only possible, but affordable to invest in. And we projected what it would be um, and immediately got a return yeah. in value. And we're like, whoa, in a year. And we're not using, by the way, we're not using other people's models. We're right. doing it all ourselves. And we always said, we're going to do this as much of this as we can ourselves um, because that's really the only way we can, you know, uh, justify uh, the, the innovation, the investment. Um, and so really that inspiration for it came from those templates and rule-based, exception-based NLG yeah. that we didn't want to build. Because we knew if we could build open, long-form content with natural language generation, we could always back ourselves up. We could always backpedal and do those templated scalable solutions too. But we needed the uh, freehand to do it. Um, our, my original co-founder, uh, one of our original co-founders was a research scientist um, who had been um, innovating in the field as well. Uh, so I would be remiss to not mention him. Uh, mm -hmm. And he had given us some of the early inspiration to consider this too. Um, and um, he had done some of the original science on this, uh, and we took it and, and, and really made it work. But funny thing is, we make it work because of the original technology, the core. Yeah. If we didn't have the, the automation of the content brief, we couldn't do explicitly what we're doing with first draft. So, so yeah. let's, if we go back for the listeners or viewers, go back to that spring of 2015, when I was asking the question, can AI generate content? The answer, and correct me if I'm wrong at the time was, yes, it can be trained on structured data to create a narrative, Right. but can it start free form from an idea and generate something? The answer was no, not even close. Not anything worth reading. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the models were so, they degraded so badly. Um, they were you know, just not anything that could be applied, certainly not applied for marketers. It was very template driven. Um, you had a few uh, companies in the SEO space who were innovating in this area uh, using, you know, uh, randomizers and um, data databases to create kind of variant content. And then you had companies like the one you mentioned with, with automated insights and narrative science um, starting to look at possible applications in, in places like um, finance, uh, where the content isn't very uh, highly customized over large data sets, almost like product. You're basically yeah. building content products, not generating content. You know? so. so again, go back to the original question, can AI create content? Can it write my blog post? Can it write articles? The answer was no, but <laughs> I think we can agree today. The answer is yes. In some forms, uh, it can create content from an idea, from a topic. What's changed? What, what has enabled us to 
go from that five years ago where we might've looked out and said, I don't see it happening. How have we today arrived at the point where marketers need to seriously be looking at using natural language generation, again, an application of AI to generate content? Yeah, I mean, so much. So much has changed in the, just from a technology space, the ability to build precisely defined models um, that can uh, generate content, that progression just in the last year. So there was probably two or three years where good was possible and now great is possible. And there's very, a couple different ways that we can make it even more what do you define as great? Is it that if I read it, I won't know a machine wrote it? Is that great? Well, there's two. Uh, th that's a great question. I think there's there's two schools of thought on that. Um, what my inspiration is as a co-founder of, of Market Me is, is ridding the world of low quality content, okay. right? I don't want there to be a market for someone to create content that's low quality. I want the bar to be set by the technology that it's better than that low quality content. I want to be able to build high quality content. The challenge is that this workflow for marketers is it's not mature, right? So we are not used to getting content from a machine. We read it and we say, no, this isn't what I thought it would be. Okay? We always judge it. Mm -hmm. um, where we're having a lot of success is where are you're getting some repetitions with this and you're saying oh wow i see how going from concept to content brief that i validate by the way i want to build this content we have this structure i that is this is the article i would like to build right and so i'm validating that i have the vision in my mind of what this article could be um and then receiving a first version of that if i have those few steps I'm less likely to immediately judge it and go, wait a second, there's something that isn't right. I'm looking at it as a, as a tool. I'm looking at as part of my workflow. Um, so the actual immediate to publishing of this article may never get there for, my, for me you know, in the short run because I'm a marketer and I need to put my own finishing touches on it. I need to improve the production value. Uh, but what I see it as, is as yet another solution that accelerates my ability to achieve my goals. So just like Washington Post went from 10% of the events, Olympic events to publishing 100% of the Olympic events. Well, if it were just up to me or you, Paul, and you want to write an article about NLG this month, you might only be able to knock out one really good one, mm -hmm. right? But you know you should probably write about 20. If you use Market Muse, it's going to tell you the other topics you should be covering, right? right? to be able to build that cluster of content. Well, it may be the situation where you can focus on the one as a creation effort, but act as an editor on those other 20 and knock out that entire cluster this month. And so that's the type of workflow that I think is possible today. Well, I'm, I don't think it, I know it because I right. have customers that that is happening for. But the going straight to publish, I think for marketers is always going, that is going to be a, a maturity challenge throughout. And it's going to be one of these things where people are going to have to get over the judgment and recognize this as a yet another source of data that they can craft and use if it's going to be a fit for them. I think editorial teams are going to struggle as well um, in the same ways because it's a, it is a shock. It's like getting hit in the face with a glass of water when you read your first generated article that doesn't really sound terrible. It sounds pretty close. Like I would have done this differently. I would have right. added a section about this. I would have touched on, I would have probably, uh, this seems a little like it's a little fluff, right? A little fluffy. That's the kind of feedback that I get constantly when I'm having these. But it seems it's going to happen if you give it to an intern or to the like entry-level writer. Like it's, yeah. It's, yeah. If you don't think of it as the, again, the, the name, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about <laughs> first pro, first draft, but right. like, it's not finished product. It's, it's meant to be. So, I mean, for, 
for people listening who think this whole idea is abstract, that a machine could actually write a narrative, a thousand right. word narrative, what are some tools that people may be using right now that they don't even realize are being powered by this kind of underlying technology, either helping with their editing or actually composing pieces of what they write? What are some popular tools that come to mind for you there? Oh gosh, there's, you know, there's so many uh, that, but you know, just, you know, Google smart composer. Yep is a great example. That uh, everyone is probably using it. Everyone way. in your Gmail, or if you use it as your Google admin, it's part of that experience. It's finishing sentences. You know, your Grammarly, uh, there's computer vision uh, solutions like Microsoft Azure's computer vision. Um, there's summarizers uh, in browser extensions like SNAI. Um, Hemingway is, is another uh, popular one for grammar checking. Um, but there's also things you're reading, you know, there's a great percentage of, of product descriptions that are being built now on e-commerce sites, uh, even on, uh, you know, popular ones that you probably are getting things shipped for the holiday season. And those descriptions are being written out of databases. Most of the financial sites you read are having consistent posts uh, that are coming from some sort of hybrid of templating and AI. Uh, so you're reading articles and not realizing it, or you're reali reading it and going, oh gosh, well, this is useful information. I can kind of tell it's not, you know, written beautifully by a, an right. artist, right? But all of those things are, are active and it's, it's, it's only becoming more, uh, more prominent in your day-to-day -day work. You know, the question I always ask is like, how many software solutions are you interacting with each day? how many of them are processing text or processing some information right now it's almost all of them yeah. almost all technology that you commonly interact with is analyzing uh, data with natural language generation or natural language processing yeah. um, and now what we're seeing is there's there's more uh, use cases popping up and uh, you know in our case it's we want you to be able to put your best foot forward. We want you to never write content that isn't as good as or better than your competitors every time. And this is yet another way we can allow you to publish everything to, to tell the story about your business or your blog or, or otherwise. And I think that that's um, a really special use case. Uh, you know, you look at like a narrative science or an automated insights in there, you know, it was, hey, let's get your data out of databases and onto, onto the web and tell, tell a narrative with it. And, yeah. a very different goal. Um, and I think that we will backpedal into that use case as kind of a hybrid of editorial text in addition to what we're doing. Um, and we already know we can do it. We just took a different approach to the market because we think this is the, um, this is the market breaker for, the, for, for natural language processing. It's being able to write content and tune it to write like Paul. <laughs> and that's, that's, what we, that's what we can do. So I, I took your state of natural language generation course that you created for our AI Academy for Marketers. And thank you. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> in that course, you talked a number of times about uh, an innovation called Grover. And mm -hmm. you talked about how important, like a milestone that was in what Grover enabled. Can you explain to us like what, what is Grover and how did maybe that play into the, the thing people may have heard more about, which is GPT-3? So maybe yeah. like we'll, we'll get into how you guys are applying similar tech, but the couple of things in the last even 19 or I guess since early 2019 mm -hmm. that you identified as some really important advances. And when you did that course, GPT-3 hadn't happened yet. It was actually recorded GPT-3. It was just happened, yeah. Yeah, so why don't you just explain to us just a couple of those advancements, and then I want to talk a little bit about what you guys are doing and, and where this may lead us as an industry. Yeah, sure. So um, Grover is cool. Um, if you if you look for it, it'll be under Rowan, um, Rowan Zeller's site. Uh, okay. He was one of the innovators. Um, and they the goal was effectively, we have a major societal problem in fake news. We can, we yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have you heard that? There's a, no, but, and there's also the potential for it, yeah. right? 
Um, so the and propaganda. Uh, so so fake news doesn't necessarily mean one like one side of the political not the, spectrum. Not it's, the politically. No, we're talking about actual propaganda of like things that are created out of nothing that never happened and aren't real information. Yeah, this is That's, not politically driven. This yeah. is literally I'm telling somebody's writing machine written content that has no basis in any data, right. has has no training of any kind. It's it's just you know mimicking the style right. of a corpora, a, 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 a document. Right. So it has nothing to do with politics. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so the, um, uh, the, the cool innovation there was you could actually train a tuna model that uh, mimicked a, a writing style, right? Um, and so they had created it and they had a few, you know, tools that you could test it out and like start writing a, a paragraph or give it a topic and it would just shoot out a random, you know, blob of text. And yeah. this was, in, this was interesting because, but this, the goal of that team was to develop a strategy to respond to attacks or in, in instances where that type of thing might permeate in, you know, in society. And I think mean, if you're a brand, mm -hmm. people can create fake things about your company or your leaders or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So this is very relevant. The idea that someone could, in theory, create completely fake stuff about you and do it at an infinite scale almost. Like just create as much as I want about this brand is, and the ability to identify that and be able yeah. to react. Like this is critical stuff that most oh. brands don't even know is possible. Aren't even watching. Yeah. Um, not only that is other people are summarizing text. Um, even Google in some of their more recent implementations are reading text and trying to, um, like DeepMind, for example, mm -hmm. um, is able to, uh, if you look at scoring models in that specific component of what they're doing, it's you're looking at snippets and you're trying to identify the things that signal that this page is extraordinary. extraordinary. Um, and then you're seeing answers appear in search results and you're seeing right answers, but you're also seeing wrong answers. Um, you know, the, the new joke is the, uh, the SERP derp. It's where you actually are right in the question and the answer is so wildly wrong, right? Um, and it's because, you know, there's a lot of content out there that is being digested differently than one would intend. Um, so there's like two stages of this and Grover was a, just a cool example like that this can happen. Um, it's much more like the implementation of the tool was to show it and like wow people. It's you know much more of a, a of an exciting kind of observation uh, that it was possible. Um, and yeah, basically putting yourself in the situation where the system, you know, for 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 building content is possible. And then you know what? But what is the ideal model though? It's that you can generate text that actually is trained for writing style. It meets the specifications that you want and it retains its coherency throughout the document. And that wasn't what that was focused on. It was really focused on identifying whether something was machine driven or not. Gotcha. Um, and, uh, and now with the innovations that we'll discuss, you know, we, we've, we've gotten closer to part two. So we can actually identify, you can actually identify still uh, whether something was or whether something wasn't, wasn't less and less over time. So, yeah. And then I, we could spend an entire episode just talking about GPT-3 and compare it, but give a kind of a, you know, a 30 second overview, like what is GPT-3 and, and why might it matter to our audience? Oh, I mean, it is, there's, there's so much to, that you can read online that I will, you know, We'll put it in the show notes too. We yeah. can put some of the resources in there. Yeah, get it. Get get some details. Um, well, the way to really think about it is that there are massive. Um, it, it's at massive scale. Uh, it's a general purpose language model. It can be. It, it's kind of like the play doh. It's it's unformed for a specific use case. Okay. Um, but it. For marketers, it lacks structure and provides pretty shallow topical coverage with its standard output of something that you can train. Um, it's really not thinking about your workflows yet. 
Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a date. It's a, it's a source. It, it's a general purpose thing, but it is magnificent. I mean, the, just the scale is almost difficult to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really what to think about from a, um, from a content creation. It has infinite use cases that people right now are just figuring out. Chatbots, customer service, creation of original pieces. Like it's. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The, but, you know, so what, what has to happen is someone needs to take either build their own technology or start to think about ways to make it not suffer from what it suffers from out of the box. Um, not just cost, which, you know, it is uh, licensed exclusively uh, by open AI through Microsoft right now. So you can't go buy, like you're, if you're listening to this, you can't go search like GPT-3 and just buy it and start building things. That's not how it works. Yeah, you're licensing it uh, through, open AI has an ex exclusive agreement for um, through Microsoft so you can buy credits and use it. Um, but you're not going to be able to like go in and say, hey, right, go write this article. Write right, my blog post for There's me. There's a lot. Yeah. Of it, right? uh, but, you know, even when you are training it to build content you're going to get chunks of like if you probably read the article on guardian uh, that was written yeah. if you haven't looked at, um that was a mashup of uh paragraphs from 10 generations so they picked and choose and they folded it in to, to make it read like the author wants. It's like taking the product shot of the burger if your burger he's like the be absolute best picture you can get like this is it <laughs> yeah and yeah, exactly. So if you're if you're just asking it to go run free, it's not going to come out that way right yeah. now, right? Yeah. So it suffers from degradation. It still suffers from you know repetition. It's not doing things like checking for plagiarism. Um, it's certainly not doing a deep dive and learning about a topic, okay. right? And so that's where this isn't specifically tuned for marketers. Okay. Um, there are, it, it has the potential to be, and the next versions of it, you know, will get closer and closer to that. But will it ever the, solve the kinds of problems that marketers have for specific use cases? Just keep an eye on the solutions being built with the models, with the, with the technology. I saw one that was writing very, very short form product descriptions, uh, you know, two sentence product descriptions that looked pretty deadly. I yeah. mean, that was, yeah, that was very sexy. Um, but I haven't seen anything to compare with what we've been building. Yeah. So um, tell us about first draft. Like what is that? What is what you guys have been building and, and how is it maybe a little different than? So yeah, no, for sure. For sure. So, you know, not to get too much into the um, exhaustive technology of it, but we, we, we take the model of where our goal is to, obviously we don't want the, the poor quality content to exist. We're also looking to give people objective ways of measuring the quality and comprehensiveness of content. That's okay. always been the model, that's our technology. We can yeah. actually read an article and tell you how comprehensive it is on a particular topic. We can tell you whether it was written by an expert. So we wanted to use that innovation and that technological advancement that we had and also our content briefs, which basically are the outline um, and tell the story for a single source of truth for a writer. So we wanted to take all of those things to be able to build content and build that, you know, those specific graphs. Yeah. And so what we do, you know, in a high level is we're able to build a base, a model uh, that is the person, the, the model of the world that's the wisest on the topic you care about. Yeah. Okay, it is the brilliant, it knows everything about this thing. How do you get bees out of your garage? I mean, it can be something really specific or it can be something like AI. Um, and then we want to train it against that, you know, that de the details that you care about, the personalized stuff. So how you wrote all your other articles about this, how you write generally, how all of your authors write as a collective hive. You know, it can be done on any level and we're able to generate the content that hits all those specifications and would be, quali would qualify against the content brief. Um, and when you, when we, the way that we've done that, it, you know, does the unique, some of the unique aspects are that it has memory modeling. I can't get into all the details, but right. 
it has memory modeling so that it stays in the it stays in the moment, right? <laughs> it doesn't lose track of what it's AI writing. forgets. It doesn't have memory per se like the right. humans do. It doesn't. Yeah, it's and so we has con we understand context. We understand yeah. intent. We understand what it means to be an expert. We understand comprehensiveness. We don't lose our place in line as we're going. We're not repeating, and right. so we've built this technology to write the article that you order. Mm -hmm. And now we keep innovating that. And it keeps, and we keep focusing on making those better. That first draft, the goal is to have a higher hit rate for someone looking at it and immediately getting over that first tendency to judge um, and, and transitioning to, whoa, this sped me up. It's not perfect, but I might be able to get this out in an hour or two, right? And wow, what? and I didn't have to do anything but look at the brief, maybe build the brief, depending on what, what, what you know, market news plan I'm working under. I build the brief, I order it. Yeah, this is the one I wanted. Shoot me the draft, it appears. And then we're creating novel user interfaces to work with those drafts to emulate the way we worked with, you know, on user research of how people work with this type of thing. So um, what you'll see in January when this goes into production is you can actually bring the draft into a text editor okay. into in multiple formats. You can actually bring it in on the side and drag pieces of it That's in. Cool. You can take sections. You can reject sections. You can do all kinds of different things to speed up that process of building something you're proud of which is the goal yeah um, and i think that that's a very different goal um than what people are naturally thinking uh with nlg um and it's but it's always been what we've strived for you know i want the i want you i want paul i want you to put be able to put out more content that you're proud of with the same resources or less um, and that, you know, that we are so close to that. Um, and it's going to happen in, you know, in the first half of next year. And, and, and it's, it's, it's exciting. It's really exciting. So I was going to ask a kind of wrap on this section. Um, 12 months from now, 24 months from now, I mean, 2021, 2022, what is how is content marketing different? How's content creation different for the industry? And, you know, give me a, like a minute or two on just how you see, because the advancements are moving so fast. It is hard. It's hard for us. And I mean, you're in it more than even me, but I mean, sometimes I will step back and be like, I can't, I can't believe that GPT-2 was February of 2019. Then oh. we had like an advancement in the fall. And then all of a sudden GPT-3, it's like, man, this fundamental question I asked five years ago about can AI create content? It's just, I'm having trouble keeping up. So what does this mean? Like, what does it mean to, to the marketers in the industry of where, where we're going to go with content creation and language generation? Well, I think the first thing you'll see, which has already started to happen, is the market for low quality human written content disappears. Okay. And there's a lot and, of that. And so the, the, the industries, the content farms, the outsourced, you know, the, the non-native translation spinning services go yeah. away. All yeah. those groups are already having to change their business models and actually focus on content and managed services. Right? That, the race that to is, the bottom is, of three cents a word is done. I, I don't, yeah. you don't have any complaints it's, from me. <laughs> it's gone. I mean, it is gone. I mean, it, it, it will be gone in, in 12 months because it's not, in, it's not effective. First of all, um, the other hybrid to that concept is those same resources will have technology that lets them write at a higher level. But the outcome is the bar for quality content quality goes up. And that is the first prediction of the first Jeff prediction. I like it. Yeah. Um, the second, the second one is uh, a little bit controversial. Okay. That I'll say is the various search engines and directories that exist are really gonna to have to change the way they think about what they do. And the controversial part of it is that many, a lot of consolidation is happening already. Um, and it's the, you know, one entity doesn't own one site. Yeah. You know, one entity owns 50 sites, owns a hundred sites, owns many brands. Um, and 
when those businesses are content powerhouses editorially, and they already produce high quality comprehensive content, when those businesses become enabled with this type of technology, it could become the situation where when somebody is researching a particular topic, um, they have, you know, 20, 30, 50 entities on the web and they can monopolize a finding, a findability, you know, workflow, um, yeah. a finding workflow. So I think that what, what is going to have to happen in, it probably won't be a year, but it'll be, you know, two years or three years is the figuring out the real estate dynamics and true ownership will be a top priority. And it's already starting to happen. There is, I watch the search results aggressively at scale and it's not, it's no longer about who's winning and who's losing. It's not, that is not what people should be watching right now. What people should be watching right now is acquisitions and ownership amongst entities as well as partnerships. Um, that's where the story is going to be in two hmm. years. It's how no matter what you do, if you're looking for an X, your money goes to Y entity. Interesting. And that's that's a problem. Yeah. It's controversial. Like that's a whole that's, other that's a whole other episode. <laughs> that, that, that's, where, that's why that's something that natural language generation brings front and center. Yeah. And I think it's something that should have should be already being dealt with, but first natural generation brings that to the top of the priority list for the biggest businesses in the world right now. All right, well, we're going to wrap up this episode like we always do with our rapid fire questions for Jeff. You ready for rapid fire? You got it, always. All right, first one. Voice assistant you use the most. Alexa, Google Assistant, Surrey, Cortana, or I don't use them. Very rarely when playing with the kids, Alexa. Okay. I, I turned the Alexa off in my house. I, I, we have it turned off, except yeah, when when it is to. Uh, I should probably add Apple to that. I I use our Apple HomePod more. Um, oh well, I guess technically that's Surrey. So, all right, uh, more valuable in ten years. Now I don't know if you have like bias because you have one, but computer science degree or liberal arts degree. Oh, a computer science degree. Okay. All day. Hey, all ironically, day. like we we've asked that question of like some expert in specs or spotlight. It's like 50-50. Oh, um, and Mark Cuban is on record numerous times saying he thinks liberal arts degree in 10 years is more. Valuable. I think the computer science degrees enable you to think abstractly. Um, I think that the, the, the market is with for kids. Yeah. It's so ubiquitous that they can control computers and phones and devices, but they're, they're not thinking about computer science. And when they get the ones that are really enabled and then they actually learn computer science, their superpower, machine, their mission. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably with you in that camp. Mm -hmm. All right. Net, net effect over the next decade, more jobs eliminated by AI, more jobs created by AI, or it's not really going to have a meaningful impact on our economy. Oh, created. Not just in marketing, big, big picture. Created. Absolutely. Yeah. Created all day. Yeah. What does an AI agent win first, or at least share with a human Nobel Peace Prize, Oscar, Pulitzer, or it's not going to win anything? So it's going to be a writer. It's going to share it with a writer. It's going to be an acting. It's going to be. Um, I would say because there's so many Oscars in obscure uh, fields, I think it will be an Oscar like item for okay. something like voice over excellence yeah. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Some I'm random gonna, I'm gonna go to like a tech, what are the technical Oscars that they show like the day before that'll, that'll be, that'll be. That'll I be. saw a great article the other day, making a very strong argument that, uh, deep mind, uh, alpha fold could be the first Nobel peace prize that is partially given to a machine. That's why it I'm makes, it made a ton of sense. Like the way they position is like, I think that might, I might not be able to ask that question again in a few months. Right. Then, a, te a technical Emmy or Oscar. I'll, be, I'll put that one on the right. <laughs> All right. So then the last one, favorite AI marketing tech that you use that isn't market news. Is there, is, do you guys have a go-to tool that you're using like a Grammarly or something like that, that um, is a huge part of what you're doing? 
I've got a number of them, but I would say if I have to do, if I have to say one, it's just so hard. I, I have a pile of them. I'll rattle off a few. Okay. No, I'll just limit it to one. Mad okay. Kudu is one where I really, really think. Spell that out. D-K-U-D-U. Um, M-A-D-K-U-D-U. Yeah. Okay. I, I got to check that out. I feel really strongly that the premium versions of the model training that they're doing mm -hmm. is onto something very special for predictive lead scoring. Interesting. Um, oh, you have talked to me about them before. I, I think a couple of years them. ago. Yeah, I use them. They are embedded in our workflows. I'm an advocate of theirs, but yes, um, I think that I think that it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, but already, what we've been able to do with them is is been just innovative. Uh, but I think what we're going to start seeing is product-led growth enabled predictive lead scoring yeah. capabilities um, for self-service workflows, for opportunity identification, um, that I think they may be the first mover there. And I think that that's, you know, that's the most exciting field because if someone cracks that nut, they're an insta unicorn. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I could, I mean, we could talk, we we have talked for hours about this topic, so we could keep going, but um, any final thoughts for, you know, our audience on, in terms of how they can better understand and apply AI, like just where do they start or any final tips you've got? Yeah. It's the end of the year. Take stock of your existing content inventory, understand how much, how much content you created or how many content items you updated and the outcomes that those motions delivered. Um, and if you're not happy with those percentages, it could be that your research process is bogged down by dated practices. It could be that your prioritization, like what you create is, you know, being done by the highest paid person in the room or brainstorming or, you know, some other data point that isn't legitimate. It could also be that you haven't adopted a source of truth for your writers um, and you're thinking you're getting one thing and they're writing something else. Um, and think through that content efficiency, um, no matter which area of that workflow you think is inefficient, you can fix it. And you can fix it in weeks, not months. You can put yourself in a situation where you don't make any more bad decisions on content. And this is the time when I always ask teams to look at the mirror and say, how much did we create? What did it produce? Am I happy with that? And what we talk about at Market Muse is making that a reality, but it's also for Marketing AI Institute, it's there's a solution that has that for email. There's a solution that has that reality for lead scoring or your BDR program or for, you know, so whatever, I think this is really a good time to just take stock in all your marketing channels and determine which ones are not as efficient as you want them to be. Yeah. That's a great takeaway. All right. How do, how do people find you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Jeff You're a LinkedIn at, guy, a Twitter guy, an email guy. I am a Twitter email LinkedIn guy. So Twitter, Twitter, Jeffrey underscore coil, uh, Jeff at marketmuse.com. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. Uh, any of those, two, any of those three places, um, and then yeah, come to Market Muse, uh, sign up if you heard about it here. Shoot me a note at Jeff at MarketMuse.com, um, and I'll make sure that you know everything is as described. <laughs> all right, Jeff. Well, as always, great to catch up. I'm always inspired by our conversations and hopeful for the future of our industry. Mm -hmm. so We'll have to do it again once first draft is really humming in the in the industry and come back and take a look at the impact. And when GPT-4, which I'm sure will come out next year, it's going to yeah. keep moving. So we'll they're, keep they're gonna put a super, yeah, They're going to put a supercharger on, you know, <laughs> I, knock on wood, it, it'll be Q1 yeah. uh, for first draft in full production. Uh, but if you want some examples, it's out in beta right now. So if anybody right. wants examples, uh, fire me a note, jeff at marketmuse.com, and you could have a first draft in your mailbox in a couple of weeks uh, that I personally touch. So uh, yeah, give me a buzz if you want to see this in action. It works. Great, man. All right. Well, thanks again. This has been the Marketing AI Show and we appreciate you joining us today.